Welcome to this module on Epstein's anomaly of the tricuspid valve. Epstein's anomaly is characterized by adherence of the septal and posterior tricuspid leaflet to the underlying myocardium caused by a failed delamination of the leaflets. There is an associated downward or apical displacement of the functional annulus. The displacement of the leaflets is more seen with the septal leaflet, little less with the posterior leaflet and very minimally in the anterior leaflet. The portion which gets displaced the maximum is the region of septo-posterior commissure. There is a dilatation of the atrialized right ventricle. The anterior tricuspid leaflet may have a lot of redundancy, may be associated with fenestrations, but in some cases may be tethered to the right ventricle. There is always a dilatation of the right atrioventricular junction. For the purposes of surgical repair, Epstein's anomaly is classified by Alan Carpentier into four types A to D. In type A Carpentier classification, the atrialized right ventricle is very small, the displacement is minimal and the anterior tricuspid leaflet has got normal mobility. In Carpentier's type B, the atrialized right ventricle is larger, the septal and posterior leaflet tethering is more, however the anterior leaflet retains a good mobility. In Carpentier type C, the atrialized right ventricle is much more larger, the anterior tricuspid leaflet is also tethered and so there is restricted mobility of the anterior tricuspid leaflet. In Carpentier type B, there is almost a total plastering of all the leaflets into the right ventricle, thereby leading to a huge atrialized right ventricle. In type A, the volume of the true right ventricle is adequate. In type B, a large atrialized RV exists but the anterior tricuspid leaflet is very mobile. In type C, the ATL is restricted and this restriction may even cause an RVOT obstruction. In type D, there is a complete atrialization of the ventricle with only a small infundibular right ventricle that is present. Epical four chamber view shows a Carpentier type A Epstein's anomaly. We can appreciate a minimal displacement of the septal tricuspid leaflet. The mobility of the anterior tricuspid leaflet is very good. The ATL is shaped like a large sail. Septal leaflet in Carpentier type A will be minimally be displaced towards the apex and there will be some tethering of the septal leaflets towards the right ventricular wall. Failure of delamination is the feature of Epstein's anomaly. However, we can appreciate the normal good mobility of the anterior tricuspid leaflet. In almost every patient with Epstein's anomaly, there will be a dilatation of the right atrioventricular junction. Another patient with Epstein's anomaly, Carpentier type A, where there is a small atrialized right ventricle. There is a mild narrow jet of tricuspid regurgitation jet through this Carpentier type A Epstein's anomaly of the tricuspid valve. You can also notice that there is a small atrial septal defect. Since the abnormality of the right ventricle and the tricuspid valve is not very marked in Carpentier type A, most of the atrial septal defects in Carpentier type A will be shunting left to right. Let us move on to Carpentier type B Epstein's anomaly. We can find a marked tethering of the septal tricuspid leaflet. The septal tricuspid leaflet is actually appearing as a nubbin of a small tissue. There is a substantial displacement of the STL towards the apex. However, the anterior tricuspid leaflet is very mobile. 
even though the atrialized right ventricle is quite large in this Carpentier type B Epstein's anomaly, the mobility of the anterior tricuspid leaflet is well preserved. As the septal tricuspid leaflet is markedly displaced and is very rudimentary, the cooptation is not adequate and there is a moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation. However, the anterior tricuspid leaflet's mobility is normal. In this Carpentier type B Epstein's anomaly, the septal tricuspid leaflet is pushed down about 33 millimeters towards the apex. Whenever the displacement is more than 8 millimeter per meter squared body surface area, it is considered a significant displacement. We can also appreciate the significant displacia of the septal tricuspid leaflet. It's hardly appearing as a tiny nubbin of tissue. On this parasternal short axis view, we can appreciate the dilatation of the right atrioventricular junction, the normal attachment of the anterior tricuspid leaflet, but a significant epical displacement of the septal tricuspid leaflet, a good mobility of the anterior tricuspid leaflet, and failed delamination of the septal tricuspid leaflet. Whenever the right ventricle gets dilated enormously, in Epstein's anomaly, the interventricular septum may start moving into the left ventricle in diastole and will lead to a squashed appearance of the left ventricle. This may even impair the left ventricular systolic function in late stages of Epstein's anomaly. The diagnostic feature of a Carpentier type B Epstein's anomaly is the mobility of the anterior tricuspid leaflet. The tricuspid regurgitation may be very variable in the various types of Epstein's anomaly. Since the repair of Epstein's anomaly is primarily dependent on the mobility of the anterior tricuspid leaflet, even though there is a severe tricuspid regurgitation as shown in this example, these valves will be repairable and so are grouped under Carpentier type B. On a parasternal long axis view, after we visualize the left ventricle inflow and outflow, if we make a rightward sweep, we will be able to appreciate the right ventricular inflow. We can see a dilated right atrium, the superior vena cava entering into the right atrium from the right end of the screen, a hugely dilated right atrial appendage, a small coronary sinus which indicates the location of the true tricuspid annulus and the displacement of the posterior tricuspid leaflet much below the level of this coronary sinus which indicates the atrialized right ventricle. We can notice that the anterior tricuspid leaflet has got a normal attachment and the anterior tricuspid leaflet is well mobile. Again this will qualify for a Carpentier type B Epstein's anomaly. The ballooned out dilated portion of the atrialized right ventricle seen between the posterior tricuspid leaflet attachment and the coronary sinus represents the whole portion of the atrialized RV. This atrialized RV can have thinned out wall and sometimes saculations and pouches. On the same parasternal long axis view with a rightward tilt, we can appreciate a broad jet of tricuspid regurgitation in this patient with Carpentier type B Epstein's anomaly. We have to appreciate that there is a good mobility of the anterior tricuspid leaflet. The severity of the tricuspid regurgitation may not match with the mobility of the anterior tricuspid leaflet. If the mobility of the tri anterior tricuspid leaflet is very good, it is grouped under A and B. And even if they are associated with severe tricuspid regurgitation, these valves are repairable. In type C and D, the mobility of the anterior tricuspid leaflet is markedly restricted 
And these patients, even if they are associated with very minimal tricuspid regurgitation, it will be difficult to repair them. On a subsified coronal sweep, we can appreciate a Carpentier type B Epstein's anomaly. There is a displacement of the septal tricuspid leaflet. We can notice that the anterior tricuspid leaflet is also displaced epically. The displacement of leaflets in Epstein's anomaly is more marked in the septal tricuspid leaflet, less marked in posterior tricuspid leaflet and very very occasional in anterior tricuspid leaflet. We can notice a significant portion of the atrialized right ventricle. The true right AV valve annulus is also dilated. When we utilize the three-dimensional echo probes, we can use the X-plane imaging or cross-plane imaging. In this patient with type B Epstein's anomaly, we can notice that there is a very good mobility of the anterior tricuspid leaflet that is seen on this epical four chamber view. On the left side of the screen, which is taken at zero degree, we can appreciate a marked mobility of the anterior tricuspid leaflet. However, when we utilize an explain imaging, we can appreciate that the posterior portions of this ATL are partially tethered. A better understanding of the valve is obtained by using this explain imaging. We now move on to the Carpentier type C Epstein's anomaly. The characteristic hallmark of this condition is tethering of the anterior tricuspid leaflet also. We can appreciate that there is more displacement of the septal tricuspid leaflet and the STL is also tethered to the interventricular septal walls. There is a substantially large atrialized right ventricle. We can notice the extent of displacement of the septal tricuspid leaflet from the atrioventricular valve annulus. In all the patients, the right atrioventricular junction is markedly dilated. The dilated portions of the atrialized right ventricle will bulge into the left ventricle during diastole, thereby compromising on the cavitary size of the left ventricle. This reduction in the LV preload will have an impact on low cardiac output. In this epical view, we can appreciate the dilatation of the right atrioventricular valve annulus. There is a marked tethering of the septal tricuspid leaflet. There is also a significant tethering and failed delamination of the anterior tricuspid leaflet. This results in absolutely no cooptation between the ATL and STL, leaving behind a huge regurgitant orifice. When we sweep on a posterior plane, we can appreciate the thickening and dysplasia of the anterior tricuspid leaflet and nodularity of the posterior portions of the anterior tricuspid leaflet. Carpentier type C Epstein's anomaly is diagnosed whenever the anterior tricuspid leaflet is less mobile and is markedly tethered to the right ventricle. The severity of the tricuspid regurgitation is not proportionate to the Carpentier's type. Carpentier type D is the extreme form of Epstein's anomaly where there is a complete failed delamination of all the leaflets. We can notice that the whole of the anterior tricuspid leaflet is significantly tethered on to the right ventricular anterior free wall. There is a marked dilatation of the right atrioventricular junction and the intraventricular septum keeps bowing into the left ventricle in each diastole. In the same patient, when we make an anterior sweep, we can appreciate that the most anterior portions of the ATL have got some degree of mobility and the posterior portions of the ATL are totally tethered. There is only a very minimal tricuspid regurgitation, even though the abnormality is more marked. Another example of a Carpentier type D, Epstein's anomaly, where there is a total plastering of all the leaflets to the right ventricular free wall. 
The atrialized portion of the right ventricle is markedly dilated and aneurysmal in patients with Carpentier type D Epstein's anomaly. We can notice that the area of the right atrium and the atrialized right ventricle will be much, much more larger than the combined area of the left atrium and left ventricle. One of the auscultatory hallmark of Epstein's anomaly is a split in the first heart sound which is almost never appreciated in a normal heart. The split of the first heart sound is caused by a delay between the mitral valve closure and the tricuspid valve closure. Since the anterior tricuspid leaflet is large and mobile, it moves like a sail slowly in right ventricular systole and coops with the other two leaflets much later after the systole starts. This results in a mitral valve closure to a tricuspid valve closure time delay. This delay is also called as the MCTC time delay, mitral closure, tricuspid closure time delay. On an M mode, we can appreciate that there is a time delay of close to 100 milliseconds between the mitral valve closure and the tricuspid valve closure. This results in a splitting of the first heart sound. When we do the M mode to identify this delay between the mitral valve closure and the tricuspid valve closure, we can also notice that the tricuspid valve anterior leaflet's excursion in diastole and systole is quite marked. This long excursion of the anterior tricuspid leaflet indicates that the anterior tricuspid leaflet is very, very mobile and it is a good sign of operability. So identifying on M mode this large anterior tricuspid excursion is very important. The dilatation of the atrialized portion of the right ventricle is an echocardiographic predictor about the severity of Epstein's anomaly and the repairability of the Epstein's anomaly. From Glasgow, Salamager has proposed an echocardiographic index which is calculated by combining the area of right atrium and the atrialized right ventricle and dividing it by the functional right ventricle and left heart on the denominator. If the ratio is less than 0.5, it's called a grade 1 type of Epstein's anomaly. If the ratio is more than 1.5, it is called as grade 4 type of Epstein's anomaly. In this worst case scenario of Epstein's anomaly, we are showing a hugely dilated right atrium, a hugely dilated atrialized right ventricle, the true right ventricle is literally not seen and a small left atrium and left ventricle is seen on the right hand of the screen. This will obviously give a cell major index the ratio of more than 1.5 thereby making it a grade 4 Epstein's anomaly. Most patients with Carpentier type D abnormality will have a much higher cell major index. Yet another way of identifying the size of the atrialized right ventricle will be by just measuring the length of the right atrium and the atrialized right ventricle and comparing with the lengths of right ventricle and the left atrium and left ventricle. Here the combined height of the right atrium and the atrialized right ventricle is about 9.3 centimeters. The true right ventricle is about 5 cm. The left atrium and the left ventricle are again about 5, 5 cm each. And this is a relatively milder form of Epstein in comparison to the previous example shown. If the atrialized right ventricle is much, much larger than the true right ventricle, the surgical results are poor. In most cases of Epstein's anomaly of tricuspid valve, the right ventricular systolic pressure and the pulmonary artery systolic pressure are very low. And so we will have a very low pressure tricuspid regurgitation jet. We can appreciate a TR jet of only 1 meter per second in this instance.
One of the peculiar abnormality noticed in Epstein's anomaly is the displacement of the leaflets towards the right ventricular outflow tract. We can notice in this subsified short axis view a good mobile anterior tricuspid leaflet. However, the orifice of the tricuspid valve is directed towards the right ventricular outflow tract and the infundibulum. This feature is important to be noticed in patients with Epstein's anomaly. This can be appreciated better by an explained imaging. On the image seen on the left hand of the screen, we are showing a subsified coronal view wherein the entire anterior tricuspid leaflet is opening towards the right ventricular outflow tract. There is a marked displacement of the posterior tricuspid leaflet below. There is a markedly dilated atrialized right ventricle also. On the right hand of the screen, we have a look at the subsified short axis view and we can appreciate the tricuspid valve orifice directed towards the right ventricular outflow tract. Subsified short axis view in Epstein's anomaly is good to show the thinned atrialized dilated portion of the right ventricle which will be adjacent to the diaphragmatic surface of the heart and also demonstrate the rotation of the tricuspid valve towards the right ventricular outflow tract. On a parasternal short axis, we can appreciate a significant displacement of all the leaflets towards the apex. All the leaflets are very well mobile. However, the orifice is directed towards the right ventricular infundibulum. This rotation of the tricuspid valve has to be recognized before surgery. On a subsified short axis view, we can also notice the epically displaced leaflets. As we sweep the probe more and more towards the left ventricular apex, we will start appreciating the epically displaced septal and the posterior leaflets. Right ventricular outflow tract or the infundibulum is dilated in most of the patients with Epstein's anomaly. In this parasternal long axis view with a leftward sweep, we are able to appreciate the pulmonary valve and a small main pulmonary artery. However, the right ventricular infundibulum is hugely dilated. We can measure the right ventricular outflow tract. In this parasternal long axis view with a leftward sweep, the RBOT is measuring more than 5 centimeters and this dilated right ventriculum, in ventricular infundibulum may sometimes act as focus for ventricular arrhythmias in the post-operative period. Some patients with Epstein's anomaly may have associated pulmonary stenosis. In this subsified short axis view, we can notice an unobstructed flow into the infundibulum. The infundibulum is not dilated. However, there is a turbulence below, beyond the pulmonary valve indicative of valvar pulmonary stenosis. On a parasternal long axis view, we can notice the narrowed infundibulum and a thickened pulmonary valve indicating presence of both infundibular and valvar pulmonary stenosis. Right ventricular outflow tract obstruction in Epstein's anomaly can be caused by valvar pulmonary stenosis, very rarely an infundibular pulmonary stenosis. Extremely rarely, the anterior tricuspid leaflet which gets displaced towards the right ventricular outflow tract can float within the right ventricular outflow tract cavity and cause an obstruction from the leaflet attachment itself. Very, very rarely Epstein's anomaly can be associated with a total pulmonary atresia. When an Epstein's anomaly presents in the neonatal period with a poorly functional right ventricle, the right ventricle may not have an adequate systolic contractility to pump the right ventricular blood into the pulmonary valve and this is described as functional pulmonary atresia. However, as the baby grows and the fetal pulmonary vascular resistance reduces, the right ventricle will be able to eject into the pulmonary valve because of the fall of pulmonary artery pressures in the postnatal period. 
So this functional pulmonary atresia will be seen only in neonatal period and as the baby grows up, the pulmonary valve opening can be appreciated. However, rarely there can be true valvar pulmonary atresia in Epstein's anomaly. This is an example of a valvar pulmonary atresia. On the parasternal short axis view, we can appreciate the well-formed main pulmonary artery and right and left pulmonary arteries. All of them are hypoplastic. On a magnified view, we can appreciate the well-formed pulmonary sinuses, main pulmonary artery, right and left pulmonary artery, even though they are uniformly hypoplastic. In patients with Epstein's anomaly and pulmonary atresia, the pulmonary blood flows are dependent on the ductal pattern C. And this is a duct dependent pulmonary circulation. We can notice a continuous flow of blood from the descending thoracic aorta through the ductus into the main pulmonary artery. The right ventricular cavity is markedly dilated. However, there is no anti-grade flow through the atretic pulmonary valve and the pulmonary artery flow is entirely dependent on the patent ductus arteriosus. From a suprasternal view, when we visualize the long axis of the aortic arch, we can notice a ductus arteriosus which is feeding the pulmonary arteries. In most cases of Epstein's anomaly, there will be an atrial septal defect or a patent foramen ovale and there will be bidirectional flows. The more severe the tricuspid valve abnormality and more hypoplastic the right ventricle, the right to left shunt will keep proportionately increasing. In this subsified coronal sweep, we can appreciate a bidirectional flow through an atrial septal defect in Epstein's anomaly. Another example of a patent for amino whale in a patient with Epstein's anomaly where there is a total right to left flow only. Whenever the abnormality in the tricuspid valve is marked as in Carpentier type C or type D valves or when the right ventricular true cavity is extremely hypoplastic, there will be a substantial right to left shunt through this for amino whale. Arrhythmias are also more common in Epstein's anomaly. Episodes of supraventricular tachycardia caused by accessory pathways can be seen in Epstein's anomaly. However, they are brief episodes and they present with significant palpitations and cardiac compromise. Bradyarrhythmias are also common in Epstein's anomaly. Due to marked dilatation of the atria, atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation are commonly seen in grown-up patients with Epstein's anomaly. In this patient with Carpentier type C Epstein's anomaly, we can notice a significant tethering of the anterior tricuspid leaflet, a marked displacement of the septal and posterior tricuspid leaflets, a dilatation of the true right ventricular AV junction and the flutter waves are causing the mitral valve mobility. When we do a pulse wave Doppler integration across the tricuspid valve, we can notice a small antigrade flow during each of the flutter waves from right atrium into the right ventricle. Atrial fibrillation is also more common in Epstein's anomaly and we can notice dense spontaneous echo contrast in the right atrium due to atrial fibrillation and lack of contractility of the right atrium. This atrial fibrillation can result in formation of huge right atrial clots in these patients. Tricuspid valve repair is done by plicating the atrialized portion of the right ventricle so that the AV junction is brought back to its normal position. In this post-operative patient on a transesophageal echocardiogram, we can notice that the tricuspid annulus has been reduced with a suture annuloplasty and by plicating the atrialized right ventricle, 
the annular plane has been brought superiorly to the normal level and there is a mild tricuspid regurgitation which is of low velocity. Post tricuspid valve repair, we can notice the small tricuspid annulus reduced by suture annuloplasty and a mild tricuspid regurgitation jet. In some patients with Carpentier type A F Shins anomaly, where the mobility of the leaflets are very good and the regurgitation from the tricuspid valve is very less, atrial septal defects can cause a completely left right shunt and result in progressive increase of the right atrial and right ventricular size. In those patients, there may be a role for non surgical ASD device closures. This is an example of a patient about 5 years after device closure of an atrial septal defect which shows a good mobility of the anterior tricuspid leaflet and minimal dilatation of the right atrium and right ventricle. We can notice that there is a very small narrow jet of tricuspid regurgitation which is very mild and the right ventricular systolic function is well preserved. 3D echocardiogram provides an additional insight into evaluation of patients with Epstein's anomaly. While the caudal displacement or epical displacement of the septal and posterior tricuspid leaflet can be appreciated on two dimensional echo itself, the rotation of the tricuspid annular plane towards the tricuspid right ventricular outflow region is better appreciated on three dimensional echocardiogram. In this subsified view, we are cutting the heart on a coronal plane. We have cropped off the entire anterior wall of the right atrium, the anterior wall of the right atrioventricular junction and anterior wall of the right ventricle. We are able to see the dilated right atrial appendage the atrialized right ventricle, the whole of the tricuspid valve plane is rotated as shown by the two arrows towards the right ventricular outflow tract. The right ventricular outflow tract and the pulmonary valve are seen above. On this magnified view of three dimensional echocardiogram, we can appreciate the good mobility of the anterior tricuspid leaflet the rudimentary septal and posterior tricuspid leaflets which are displaced down, the atrialized right ventricle is appreciated better. Both the true tricuspid annulus and the, the tricuspid annular plane where the posterior and septal leaflets are attached are shown very clearly. The tricuspid valve orifice is opening superiorly towards the right ventricular outflow tract. This rotation of the tricuspid valve plane towards the right ventricular outflow tract is a characteristic feature of Epstein's anomaly. This rotation of the tricuspid annular plane towards the right ventricular outflow tract can be of varying degree. If there is a more marked rotation of the tricuspid annular plane towards the right ventricular outflow tract, the atrialized right ventricle will be grossly be dilated and that will be an indication for using a plication of the atrialized right ventricle as a part of the repair. The more and more a tricuspid valve annular plane is rotated towards the right ventricular outflow tract, it becomes mandatory for a plication of the atrialized right ventricle to reorient the tricuspid valve. Another utility of three dimensional echocardiogram in Epstein's anomaly will be to look at the regurgitant orifice. When we see on first the regurgitant orifice in relation to the tricuspid annular plane, we will get a rough idea about the severity of tricuspid incompetence caused by the Epstein's anomaly. Since the tricuspid regurgitation jet is of very low velocity, and often laminar, 
we will not be able to appreciate the severity of the tricuspid regurgitation by utilizing color flow Doppler alone. It's imperative to look at the gap between the cooptation of the leaflets and the regurgitant orifice by three-dimensional echocardiogram to appreciate the severity of tricuspid regurgitation. On this three-dimensional echocardiogram on fast view of the tricuspid valve leaflets, we can appreciate that even though there is a good mobility of the leaflets, there is a large central regurgitant orifice. The color flow jet of tricuspid regurgitation can accurately predict the severity of tricuspid regurgitation whenever the right ventricular systolic pressure is at least 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury. In most patients with Epstein's anomaly, the right ventricular systolic pressure will be very low and there will not be much of difference between the right ventricular systolic pressure and the peak systolic pressure seen in the right atrium. And so, the tricuspid regurgitation jet that is seen on color flow Doppler will be very laminar and of extremely low velocity. It will be difficult to understand the severity of tricuspid regurgitation jets on this low pressure TR. After a surgical repair, we can notice the longitudinal plication of the tricuspid annulus. The serrated margin of the tricuspid annulus will indicate the longitudinal plication that has been done to reduce the true tricuspid annulus. To summarize, Epstein's anomaly is characterized by failed delamination of the septal tricuspid leaflet and posterior tricuspid leaflet and sometimes the anterior tricuspid leaflet also. There is an apical displacement of both the STL and PTL with rotation of the tricuspid valve opening plane towards the right ventricular outflow tract. Surgical repair will involve plication of this atrialized right ventricle, unicus, cuspidization of the tricuspid valve and combining a bidirectional glension to offload the right ventricle.